Seeking Wisdom Week 14, King David, From Sinner to Saint, Samuel Books 1 and 2. The first and second books of Samuel bear the name of the prophet Samuel. Samuel is the only face in the Bible that is a prophet, a judge, and a priest. These books cover the end of the events of the Book of Judges and the beginning of the monarchy from the time Samuel was born in 1040 until about 970 BCE, when King David died. In the Hebrew version, the book of Samuel, both 1 and 2, is only one book. But when the Bible was translated into Greek and Latin, the book was divided into two as it is today. The books of Samuel are a collection of historical accounts. However, they do not have a continuous history regularly describing events. Rather, they are collections of stories about facts and characters. These books are written primarily to illustrate the theology of Deuteronomy and, therefore, must be classified in the history of salvation. But they do include a lot of reliable historical data, especially the events described in the reign of King David when the sovereignty was established and the relics of many kings were kept. These are not books in the ordinary historical sense. They need to have a theological view of history. That is, the author of the biblical book is not just recounting events and facts, but is contemplating our faith with God. The first book of Samuel begins with Samuel's account of his childhood, introducing him as a child of consecration, consecrated to the Lord in the temple and called by the Lord. Samuel lived in a temple about 20 miles north of what is now Jerusalem with Eli the priest. Eli was a priest in Shiloh, and because of his old age, his wicked sons ruled over the temple and misused their power. According to the first book of Samuel, God punished Eli's family because of the sins of his sons. When Eli and his sons died, Samuel became the spiritual leader of Israel and it was then that the Ark of the Covenant became a sign of religious solidarity for the tribes and the foundation for many old stories. As fate would have it, Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. This kingdom has a dark history, and as often happens, some groups opposed the monarchy and some supported the monarchy. If you have read the first book of Samuel, you know both sides had their points with conflicting stories of the anointing of Saul. Saul became a very successful leader and in his early years as king, united the tribes of Israel and formed a powerful army that defeated many of Israel's enemies. But eventually Saul began to disobey God and misused his power. He started to whip and beat those who were close to him including guards beside him and David, his son-in-law. Saul had recognized that David was to be the chosen one, while he was rejected, and the good spirit of the Lord left Saul to be with David. David decided to flee and became the leader of an army. He then wandered the Palestinian region until Saul died in the battle against the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. The loss of the good spirit was a major tragedy of the first king of Israel. With the death of Saul, the way was paved for David to become king and was asked to rule the tribes of Judah. However, the other tribes followed Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and within seven years there was a war between the army of Ishbosheth, led by Abner, and David's soldiers, led by Job. After one quarrel, Abner, the general of Ishbosheth, decided to support David. This change in support solidified David's leadership. Eventually, the United Kingdoms of Israel accepted David as king. Under David's leadership, Jerusalem was conquered, turning it into his capital. It was then that the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem, making it the religious, and political center for all the tribes of Israel. David's armies then began defeating many of the Israelites' enemies, 
accumulating land masses, strengthening armies, establishing governments, and dealing with other nations competently. He also built a palace and then carefully planned the construction of a temple. In about 40 years, he was able to transform a disorganized nation into a competent and successful country. David's career was not without tragedies. In the second book of Samuel, we learn of David's sin with Bathsheba and the killing of her husband Uriah. And later, we also learn of the sins of David's son Ammon, who raped his half-sister and was later killed by Absalom. After some time, Absalom made peace with David, then was killed leading a rebellion. Yet again, David conquered enemies and strengthened his power and leadership. The generations that followed David looked to him as the greatest king of Israel. His achievements were remarkable and he was very humble when confronted by Nathan about his sins. Nathan was able to promise David that by the power of God, his kingdom would last forever. This prophecy became a hope for the Israelites in their times of defeat and weakness when they began to expect a Messiah to come from the line of David and restore their faith and hope. The hope they expected was eventually fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the establishment of the eternal kingdom. King David was truly an exemplary monarch who was worthy of the title of the great king of a blessed dynasty, whose crown would be the messianic king, Christ of God. So let's look at how the books of Samuel compare to our everyday life. Do you listen to the voice of God? We should all be listening to his voice. From the very beginning, Samuel was consecrated to God and lived with the priest Eli in God's sanctuary. God called Samuel, but the boy only recognized God's call through the guidance of Eli. This fact shows the importance of spiritual discernment in the Christian life of faith. God speaks to us through the Bible and through events of our life, but sometimes God speaks to us through the people we meet in life. Thanks to that deep inner life, Samuel heard the Lord's voice and he responded to the Lord, Here I am. This response shows a willingness to do God's will, in contrast to the moral degradation of the priesthood at the time. Samuel was a faithful priest chosen by God to replace the unfaithful priesthood and a model of how we need to listen to the Word of God. Do you think God chooses things differently than we do? He does. Here is one, here is one example. Samuel was sent to anoint the son of Jesse by the anointed Lord. But even Samuel did not expect that God would choose a shepherd boy with nothing special compared to his big, big brothers. The Lord said to Samuel, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As humans, we are controlled and governed by our senses and appearances when we value a person or recognize an event. God wants us to learn to live with inward depth, to cultivate the inner person rather than just taking care of the outer forms. Or think about this example. What about the unequal battle between a giant and experienced combatant, Goliath, and the boy with only a sling and five rocks? Who thought David would win? David's statement shows where his strength and victory come from. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Every day we have to fight the battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. We only conquer evil and sin when we rely on the power of God. The jealousy of Saul must be looked at as a valuable lesson to each and every one of us. King Saul, the first king of Israel, was disgraced and dethroned because of narrow-minded jealousy. At the root of the jealousy was the praises that David received, which caused King Saul to spend the rest of his life trying to kill David. The source of jealousy is often selfishness and narrow-mindedness, placing one's interests and status over the common good thereby reducing success and humiliating others. At some point, when jealousy is at its peak, it will be the cause of many other problems. 
Jealousy is a bad habit that exists in almost all people at different levels and causes the destruction of unity and peace in a family, the church, and society. As Christians, we must be aware of and strive to overcome our feelings of jealousy by learning to look at the common good and the plans of the Lord, rather than just thinking about yourself. If we are truly passionate about the work of God and the common good of all, we will gladly welcome and collaborate with anyone who serves the common good of the community. How do we go from sinner to saint? David is considered as the great and holy king of Israel, but even he made many mistakes. The Bible tells us a story of how David took the wife of Uriah and murdered him to hide his sin. But thanks to the word of God through the mouth of the prophet Nathan, he repented and was forgiven. The prophet Nathan, he repented and was forgiven. Like David, we carry within us the weakness of a human being. The spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak. Or as St. Paul says, Good things I want, I do not do. Bad things I didn't want to do, I kept doing. This awareness can help us to be humble and alert to the temptations in the life of faith. We now listen to the following story about David to see the conversion of man and God's mercy to penitent. King David Sinned One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David was to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. And David called Uriah back from the battlefield to erase his guilt. But Uriah did not sleep with his wife, causing David to kill him by others' hand. King David wrote to Job and sent it to Uriah. In the letter the king wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him, so he will be struck down and die. So while Job had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Job, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. When Uriah was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David has done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. A saint is not a person without sin, but a sinner forgiven by God, and God's love greater than all sins committed by man.
Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this week's lesson. Please join us next Friday for our new video. The answers to this week's questions will be revealed in next week's video. Remember, every Friday at 7 p.m. the Seeking Wisdom Challenge will be posted on YouTube and Facebook. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, or subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and we wish you a wonderful weekend full of grace and joy.